Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Laura. Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, and I'm very grateful to, uh, to the C-SPAN crew for, for being on the scene as well. So I'm delighted to be here this evening. And um, I'm grateful also to my sister for putting me up when I told her that I was going to invite myself to Denver and try to give uh, a talk at the Tattered Cover, this being a pretty legendary independent bookseller. There are a lot of ways that I could structure um, what I'd like to share with you about my book, but I decided in the end uh, it might just be easiest to explain how I came to write it. So that takes us back to the summer of 2006. I should say that I, I love being a historian. I have uh, since uh, I started graduate school in the late 1990s. I like my job quite a lot, but that was tested uh, in, uh, in June 2006. Uh, I spent that month in Helena as a fellow with the Montana Historical Society to work on the Cypress Hills Massacre. Let me pause and ask, has anybody heard of the Cypress Hills Massacre? Okay, excellent. Uh, this is exactly why I thought I was going to be spending some time with that event, because it was this sort of notorious but obscure um, 1873 slaughter in which a group of Montana wolf trappers uh, slipped across the border between the U.S. and Canada uh, and killed some two dozen Assiniboine Indians. And I thought that I would use this event, this is why I'd gone to Montana in the first place, I was going to use this event to explain the hardening of the U.S.-Canada border ever after, the so-called Wild West of the United States and the Mild West of Western Canada, north of the 49th parallel. So this is why I was in Montana that summer. The problem was I became very bored with this story, uh, which is a bad sign in the early going of a new project. Um, adding to my uh, displeasure, I guess, was the fact that I was living a pretty unglamorous life, which is the typical life of an academic. Um, I was eating TV dinners, uh, eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for lunch every day, allowing myself all of one Diet Coke. This was in an effort to stretch my um, my grant from the uh, Historical Society as far as I could. It was a very generous award, but I wanted to make certain that I could um, that I could get by in my month in Helena entirely on the uh, on the stipend from the Historical Society. I was also away from my wife and our uh, then three-year-old daughter at the time, so I thought I needed something to show for my month in Helena. So one day, midway through my stay, I decided to take the afternoon off to abandon the Cypress Hills Massacre and to see what else was in the Historical Society. I always heard from friends of mine who worked on Western history that this was one of the great repositories of the West. I certainly didn't doubt that. It had a wonderful staff and it's a really beautiful building located in the shadow of the Capitol. Um, but I thought, well, you know, I'll see what else I can find in the Historical Society's archives since this whole Cypress Hills business is not turning out quite as I had hoped. So in deciding where to look uh, that afternoon, I thought immediately of a novel called Fool's Crow. Does anybody know it? Tisk tisk. Uh, I'm shocked here in the West. Um, I would have thought this needed no introduction, but maybe you could go and find a copy of that after you've bought a few copies of my book to take home with you and give as holiday presents. So Fool's Crow is a, is a novel written in the mid-1980s by a Blackfoot author named James Welch. Um, and it's a piece of historical fiction set in the late 1860s and early 1870s. Uh, and it's a wonderful novel. It's beautifully written, but it's really powerful, I think, in giving uh, its readers a chance to... Um, get a sense of what the invasion of Montana and the wider West looked like in the era after um, the Civil War from the Native perspective. And as such, it's a really wonderful teaching tool, and I use it all the time. And I just taught it, as a matter of fact, at the University of Nebraska, which is, uh, which is where I was then employed. And I'd loved it all over again, as had uh, my undergraduate students. So I just read the book. It was fresh in my mind. Uh, and so in deciding where I might spend a little time that day, um, I, uh, I, thought, I thought of the novel and, um, and, and sort of connected it to my time in Montana. One incident on which the novel hinges is the murder of a character named Malcolm Clark, who's a white fur trader married to a Pekin Indian woman. And in the novel, Clark is killed by his wife's cousin, an Indian named Pete Owlchild, on his ranch north of Helena in August 1869. This Murder sets in motion a series of events that culminates tragically in the Marias Massacre of January 1870, which is the darkest day in Blackbeat history. And that was an event that I was familiar with, that I knew had indeed taken place. 
So that afternoon at the Montana Historical Society, I decided to find out if this Malcolm Clark was indeed a real person or whether or not James Welch has invented him as a literary device, a convenient literary device, simply to move the story along. So with help from, uh, from a librarian, and the MHS has got a really terrific staff, uh, I located pretty quickly a microfilm reel and also a vertical file of biographical information. And you can probably see where this is headed. So Malcolm Clark was indeed a real person, and his murder was indeed the watershed event that James Welch described. But Clark was, was actually a lot more than that. He was one of the most important white pioneers in Montana territory from the 1840s until the 1860s, and he was the patriarch of a really fascinating and extremely accomplished family of mixed ancestry. The timing of my discovery of the Clarks uh, was actually rather ironic, though, because I've been looking for them, or rather any racially blended family like them, for more than a couple of years. That's because I've become fascinated by peoples of mixed native white ancestry since writing my first book, which is a comparative study of the Texas Rangers and the Canadian Mounties. And in researching that book, I came across uh, the Métis, uh, who are peoples of mixed native white ancestry who are recognized by the Canadian federal government as a people who are neither native nor white, but a people in between and have separate or aboriginal or indigenous status from the Canadian government, recognized as such as an independent people. I figured that such folks had, of course, lived in the United States as well, but they were extremely hard to track, I found, because of the rather binary racial formulation in the U.S. that people were either Indian or white, and there was not much room for people in between, at least not legally, certainly not on the census records of the 19th century. So i have been interested in such people, but I'd given up the chase until I found the Clarks that day. And pretty quickly, I fell down the, uh, the Clark family rabbit hole and abandoned um, ever after the, uh, the Cypress Hills Massacre. I might quickly, though, uh, with, uh, with a group of readers, put in a plug for a really wondrous novel about the Cypress Hills Massacre called The Englishman's Boy, written by a great Canadian novelist named Guy Vanderhaeg. So if you're interested uh, in that event, um, Guy Vanderhaeg is the way to go. This is not a project to which I will be returning. Having found the Clarks, however, they were not quite what I expected, um, perhaps because of my familiarity with George Bent. Anybody hear that name ring a bell? I see sort of a couple of, of, of nods. Uh, so George Bent uh, is sort of tied up in, uh, in Colorado's history in some fascinating but painful ways. He was the mixed blood son um, of a Cheyenne woman named Owl Woman and her husband, the very prominent Anglo trader, William Bent. Uh, and George Bent grew up in um, uh, in, in eastern Colorado and in northern New Mexico during the 19th century um, and was somebody who walked in both white and native worlds. But after the Sand Creek Massacre, in which his family was intimately involved as victims in 1864, which took place, um, I'm not sure what the distance is, 100 or so miles from here on the eastern Colorado Plains, um, Bent felt particularly alienated. Um, split again between these two worlds, the white world of his father, the Indian world of his mother, and he obviously nursed a deep antipathy um, towards, uh, towards many white people for what had happened to his family at Sand Creek. Um, he gave lots of interviews to ethnographers and anthropologists, uh, was widely regarded as the sort of leading expert on the Cheyenne, his mother's people. Um, but he retreats into alcoholism and he dies a penniless in the Spanish flu pandemic at the end of the First World War. So in knowing a little bit about George Bent, um, I think I had expected that the Clark family, later generations, would have the same sort of social pathologies. But what I found was that for the Clarks, especially later generations, race was not always the intractable issue that it had been for George Bent, or especially for his younger brother, Charles, who thoroughly renounced his own Anglo heritage and plundered whites after, after Sand Creek before he was killed by um, Indian scouts working for the U.S. government when Charles was just 22. For the Clarks, in fact, race was the very attribute that got one of them uh, a, a job with the Indian service, and it was a source of creative inspiration that helped another one win fame and renown internationally as an artist. Moreover, at different moments, I found there were other variables, gender, class status, disability, that were a lot more important in shaping the choices and possibilities of later generations of the Clarks. So I use the Clarks as a lens onto uh, what I think of as the shifting grounds of race and racial identity in Montana and the wider West 
from roughly 1850 to 1950. And specifically, what I, what I track in the book is what happens to people of mixed, of mixed native white ancestry after the, uh, the wider West is incorporated and absorbed by the U.S. in the period after the Civil War. So at last, let me spend just a couple minutes talking about the, uh, the book, uh, and then hopefully I'd love to answer some questions.